Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of January 3rd, 2022. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. Also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we review the governor's proposed FY23 budget and 10-year fiscal plan released just before the holidays. Second, we discuss a recent, in our view, self-serving op-ed by a member of the top 20% that appeared in the ADN and elsewhere over the holidays, essentially praising the legislature for continuing to push the burden of government spending off on middle and lower income Alaska families through PFD cuts, an approach which largely exempts the top 20% from being required to contribute any meaningful amount themselves. And third, we discuss what we will be facing from a fiscal perspective as the COVID-related influx of federal money into Alaska recedes and things return to normal. And now, let's join Michael. So the weekly top three, Brad, I think we got three big topics. We're going to dive right into it. First and foremost, the governor's proposed budget. We didn't get much of a chance to talk about it last time. So let's uh, let's let's go ahead and, and see what's going on. Well, the governor came out in the middle of uh, December on time uh, with his proposed budget. Uh, there's two pieces to the budget uh, that I look at. One is the uh, immediate next year, the, the budget for the for the upcoming uh, fiscal year, the one that the legislature will address in uh, uh, next session. Uh, FY, in this case, it's going to be FY23. And then, and then the other piece that I look to is the 10-year plan. Uh, how does how does what the governor is proposing uh, a long term uh, play out over over the long term? Um, and so, diving into those two, the the near term budget is balanced. It's balanced. Uh, in two ways. One, it, uh, it uh, uh, relies on higher uh, oil prices than were, than were included in the spring forecast. Uh, the state's uh, traditional revenues look uh, significantly better than in the spring forecast, and that helps uh, uh, balance the budget. The other is the governor uses about $600 million of, of what are called adjustments, which are really federal funds being moved over to the UGF, the Unrestricted General Fund, uh, to help support uh, state spending. So between those two, he gets FY23 balance. There's not any significant spending cuts uh, included in the FY23 budget. Uh, there is some uh, reduction in uh, contributions to retirement due to uh, actions of the Alaska Retirement Management Board relying on the higher uh, returns that they've achieved over the last few years um, and projecting some of that forward, uh, they've reduced the annual contribution that they think they need to make to the retirement funds to keep them balanced. That shows up in a reduction in general fund spending. Um, so the governor sort of claims that's a spending cut, but it's not really. It's just a it's just a a, a, a change in the amortization to reflect the fact that that uh, returns have been higher. Beyond uh, the FY23 budget, though, things get things get loopy. Um, the governor shows, even, even the governor's budget shows deficits between FY24 uh, and FY27, um, and then shows uh, some uh, slight uh, change in that, some lower, um, um, well, not only lower deficits, but, but a small amount of surplus from FY27 uh, forward. But he's doing, but the budget's doing several things to achieve that. One is uh, it's relying on uh, 
uh, higher oil prices again, not as high as as he had projected first in the fall, uh, but uh, but but still higher oil prices than were uh, than were in the spring budget certainly, and higher oil prices than current than than the current market. So there's some of that that's going on in that period. Um, and then he is um, uh, the, the 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 real uh, the real thing that's keeping the budget down or keeping the budget closer to balance uh, uh, past uh, FY23 is he's using inflation factors of of minimal amounts. He doesn't increase the budget, doesn't increase uh, the capital budget, for example. Uh, it only increases the operating budget by 1% per year. Uh, it increases the, uh, uh, the school budget by uh, uh, by a fairly small amount. All of that uh, significantly below, below, uh, below inflation factors. It's almost as if they did the budget, they showed uh, what what the true budget would be, and then they then they backed into the inflation factors and and pulled them down in, to the to the extent they needed to uh, to show a balanced budget uh, going forward. There are no spending cuts um, uh, from FY twenty four uh, forward. You get a little bit of an effect, a little bit of a reduction from uh, the 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 restatement of the retirement amortization amount uh, that reduces the going forward budget from what we saw in spring. Um, and the all tax credits, uh, which are paid through the next uh, few years, uh, expire at some point. And so that looks like a reduction out there. But there's no there's no spending reductions. There's nothing in there that tries to implement uh, what the uh, legislative working group said earlier uh, uh, last year or in the fall last year about uh, redoing statutory uh, uh, formula programs to bring those down. There's no look at at any of the efficiencies that the working group talked about. So there's no there's no spending cuts in, in that period. It's all being done through sm the smoke and mirrors of higher revenues um, and through uh, 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 suppressing uh, the inflation inflation factors. Right. Once you adjust, once you adjust for actual inflation, uh, you have deficits uh, of, you know, 500. Well, the average over the uh, over the period to FY uh, 30 uh, from FY24 to FY30, the average deficit's about 500 million, half a billion dollars. So, once you do the adjustment for inflation factors, uh, we've got the, the the problems continue, and there's nothing in this budget, uh, nothing in the in the governor's proposal in this budget that address those, that, that that take those into account. It's almost as if this budget is, you know, get me through this year, and then I'll start worrying about I'll start worrying about the long term once I get through this year. Well, but this is not this shouldn't be a surprise. You and I had this conversation before when we were, you know, holding the envelopes to our foreheads and uh, and playing Kreskin and saying, what do you think he's going to do? And uh, this is kind of the this has been kind of the thought from everybody that I've talked to, including you, that he was not going to go out on a limb. This is an election year. Um, and I think that in honesty, he's playing a little bit of that political game to, like you said, get me through this year. And then next year, I promise I'll I'll drop the hammer and, and start ch chiseling away. Uh, it kind of feels that way. Yeah. The problem, Michael, is you can't you can't wait until a year and start chiseling away as the as the working group, which I you know continue to think did a really great job, and we ought to be looking to their recommendations as sort of the uh, as sort of the template of going forward. As the working group recognized, it takes several years to achieve spending reductions. You can't just I mean we we've essentially zeroed out the capital budget. We've taken it down to the minimal necessary to match uh, uh, federal funds. Um, and there's really no other place. I mean, we've zero, we've essentially zeroed out our savings. There's really no other place to go. The working group recognized that in order to achieve spend uh, savings over over the or achieve spending reductions over the long term, you've got to go in, you've got to redo the formula programs, look at the formula programs, and you've got to you know look at at, at deep a deep cut in in doing efficiencies or consolidations or something. That's work that needs to be done two to three years in advance right. uh, of, achieve, of, of achieving it. So, you know, if, if he's not addressing it this year, um, there, there's there's no there's there's no net underneath the FY24 through the FY30 budgets. There's nothing being set up to make those to make those better. So uh, are you surprised? I guess is my next question. Are you surprised by this or is 
I mean, were you were you hopeful for more? What 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 are your thoughts? I was hopeful for more. I was hopeful for a real. I mean, he's made the ten year plan has been realistic in previous years. It showed the budget gap. Now it didn't. It wasn't realistic in terms of addressing that budget gap. In terms of of saying how we're going to close the budget gap, there was a lot of a lot of uh, you know uh, uh, rhetoric about spending cuts and you know and maybe revenues and and that sort of thing. Uh, but it, but it was realistic. It showed red. It showed budget deficits. Now he's trying to say now the now the budget's essentially trying to say there are no budget deficits going forward. We got we got this covered, um, and and it's and it's misleading uh, uh, to the extreme in the sense of saying that you know in saying that we've got it covered going forward. So it, I sort of sit here and I go, why why does he want to be governor? What's his vision? Right. Where is he taking this? Um, uh, you know, what's the plan going forward? And and essentially the plan is, well, I'm going to come up with gimmicks <laughs> to, to try, you know, I'm going to suppress the inflation factor uh, uh, to show that, that, that spending stays down. Uh, but I've got no plan. I've got, I've got no plan for spending reductions. I've got no plan for, uh, for revenues. And the, and the ultimate consequence of this, Michael, is if you don't, if, if you, when you get up to a year and you don't have those spending cuts baked in or you don't have those revenues baked in, there's only one place to go anymore. And we've seen that since 2016. The only place to go is PFD cuts because that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the only revenue that's sitting there that the legislature easily can divert over to, uh, over to cover uh, uh, spending categories. So, I mean, he's setting, he, he's setting us up. He's setting the state up for continued deep PFD cuts. Uh, over over the coming decade by failing to address spending, long-term spending, and by failing to discuss uh, uh, alternative substitute revenues uh, over the long term. So a bit of a disappointment there in that regard, especially in the changing of how inflation is accounted for and other things uh, in the budget overall. I mean, we should just, you know, we need to be consistent. That's the problem. We can't keep changing the rules of the of the reporting or the game or how we're doing things just to, again, the voodoo economics, the shell game of smoke and mirrors. We can't keep doing that because people don't have time usually to dive down into the budgets and go over these things and understand, you know, what's going on. They've got to, you know, they they they, they hope that that's going to give them more information. And when it doesn't, it just screws everything up. So I agree with that. Um, I just got to say, Brad, I think that, you know, it's, it's, it's disappointing for a lot of us um, that this kind of went down uh, the way it did. Um, Barbara says she thinks you're being unfair. She says, no, no, there's not gimmicks. There is a House majority that does not want to cut. Um, but I want to be clear here. This is the governor's budget. This is not the House's budget. This is not the legislature's budget. This is the governor's proposed budget. And the gimmicks are in the way that he's reporting it, especially in the out years. Am I wrong? I mean, this, this is what we're talking about. He could have taken a stronger stance and laid all the cards on the table and say, here, look, here's my budget. But here's what happens in the next five years. And it's all bad in the next five years and use it as an argument to say, this is why we need to leverage down and reduce the budget. Yeah, exactly right, Michael. It's not, it's not the house that doesn't want to cut. The governor doesn't have any cuts in, in his budget. What he's, what he's doing instead is he's suppressing the inflation factor to make it look like spending is less, but that's spending's not less because of cuts that he's proposing in the budget. Spending is less only because he's jiggling with the inflation factors. Uh, the adjustment factors. So it's not, it's not, this isn't the house's fault uh, for, for not enacting cuts. I mean, maybe it's the house's fault that we'd haven't enacted cuts before, right? But this budget, this budget is not proposing budget cuts. Let's be clear about that. This budget it, on its, on its face, uh, it, it's, it's own words say that, you know, we're relying on low inflation factors on suppressed inflation factors uh, to, uh, to achieve balance. So I, I don't, I don't, you can't blame that on the House. I mean, you're exactly right. The governor should have shown a realistic budget, should have used actual inflation factors. I mean, we're in the middle of an inflation run up now, and he's using an inflation factor of 1%. Not even the, not even the Federal Reserve, not even the, the Permanent Fund Corporation are using, is using an inflation factor that low. Um, and, and so we're, you know, we're in the middle of a run up and the governor is saying, oh, no, I'm going to somehow, you know, keep... Uh, Keep spending down through uh, through supp suppressing inflation. You're exactly right. He should have shown he should have shown where we are headed, truly headed, 
and, and had a statement about how we're going to deal with that. We're going to deal with that either through budget cuts, and here's my proposed budget cuts, uh, or we're going to deal with that through alternative revenues, and here's my proposed alternative revenues, or been honest and say, yeah, we're not going to do either, and so we're just going to leave it to PFD cuts. But he didn't do any of that. I mean, he just he just sort of gimmicked the, gimmicked the budget by keeping the inflation factors down and showing the long-term numbers unrealistically, a long-term spending numbers unrealistically low. And I think that's that's the part of the problem. I think that's why a lot of us are, are so disappointed. We would we had hoped um, that the governor would stay strong in. I mean, the governor's position is a position really of of leadership. I mean, he's got his. You know, I always likened the legislature and the governor to. Uh, you know, it's a long boat with sixty oars and one guy at the tiller. Uh, you know, the guy at the tiller can can steer the boat for sure. But if the if the if all the paddlers are pulling in different directions, the boat goes nowhere, or it or, you know it goes wonky all over the place, and that's what's happening. But if 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 at least he has a few helpers and he holds the tiller where it needs to be, at least he can keep it kind of moving in the right direction. And that's how I see the governor should be doing. He should be taking a strong stand on this, and he's not. And I think it's disappointing a lot of his supporters, a lot of his base, and uh, you know it just it seems like. I mean, I guess I'll just say it. It looks like he's running scared. It looks like he's running scared from the recall effort and everything else and that he has lost his will to fight the good fight. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, you would you would hope that he would say, look, this is an election year. I've got a chance to elect a majority that will support me. I want the majority to be a majority that will support spending cuts. But I think you're right. I think he's running scared from the recall effort. I think he's running scared from, from the pushback that that he got uh, uh, from from various parts of the state when he uh, when he proposed the deep spending cuts of 2019. So he doesn't want to say that. He doesn't want to right. say that in election year. Well, but so it, you just you just as an election year, he should be saying that. Here is the yep. dire budget. Here's what I need from you. Send me back legislators who will make this happen. Stop sending the same people, but use it as a tool to say, you saw my budgets. You saw the projections. We're going into deficits. We can't keep doing the same things we're doing. You need to send new people back. It would have been a perfect campaign tool. Yeah. And now, and now people think that, okay, well, I can just send Click Bishop back, or I can just send back Bart LeBon, or I can just send back Steve Thompson or whoever Steve Thompson's replacement is. I can send back people like that. And you'll all be fine because the budget, the governor's telling me that the budget is going to be in balance without doing deep spending cuts. I don't need to have, you know, the 16 that will back him up on, uh, on deep spending cuts. I, it, it's a lost, it's certainly a lost opportunity. And it just makes you wonder what the hell the long-term vision is uh, that, that he's, that he's got for, well, for the state. I think I mean, that's you, you, the lack of that, I think is part of the problem. The lack of the long-term vision is what we're talking about here. Continuing now, Brad Keithley, our guest number two of the weekly top three, we're talking about this opinion piece, uh, in the ADN, uh, that is kind of the poster child for the whole top 20% argument of, well, we can't have taxes just to have a bigger PFD. We need all that money for government. And give me a tease here before we go to break. Well, Carl Mars, uh, before Christmas, Carl Mars, who's a, uh, an executive of, of Old Harbor uh, uh, Native Corp, which is a corporation down on the uh, down in Kodiak, I believe, um, uh, wrote an op-ed uh, that's like the perfect top 20 percent op-ed. It says, you know, congratulations to the legislature for keeping for, for funding government, for keep, keeping us fiscally sound. Uh, congratulations for using the, the permanent fund earnings to. Uh, to support government, uh, and we and we certainly uh, uh, appreciate that. You know, you never want to have taxes, and so uh, there, there's there's you know, if you got to cut the PFD, uh, that's a good thing to do. Basically, it is uh, uh, the argument that uh, uh, the, the PFD cuts are good, um, that they're that they're necessary, that the legislature should be congratulated for making them. And and thank you for not uh, thank you for not doing taxes. Thank you for doing PFD cuts instead. And I want to talk about that issue, the trade off between taxes and PFD cuts. Uh, I, the top twenty percent keeps arguing that taxes would be to pay for PFDs. It's backwards. Uh, that's a that's a backwards argument. Governor Hammond had a great vision for how to deal with this, uh, and I think we ought to be talking about that uh, uh, in response. We were just talking about number two, which is this opinion piece. Uh, from um, from uh, uh, Carl um, 
uh, Carl, I've forgotten Carl's Mars. name. Uh, Carl Mars. There you go. And you were analyzing that and giving us the uh, giving us the details on it. So could you summate that before we jump into number three real quick, just for folks who are just joining us? Sure. Here, here's here's the, the sum and substance of the argument that Mars makes, that von Imhoff makes, uh, that uh, that most in the top 20 percent make, which is which is if you have a deficit, uh, then you should use uh, PFDs. You should cut the PFD in order to in order to fund the deficit. That's exactly in order to avoid you should use the PF, PFD cuts to fund the deficit and avoid taxes. Uh, it's the PFD that needs to be used uh, to, to, uh, to plug the dike, to bridge the gap, to, to fund uh, any deficits that government has, uh, as opposed to taxes. That is a self-serving uh, position by Mars and von Imhoff and others, because the PFD means very little uh, to, their, to their income. The PFD has its most impact on middle and lower income Alaska families. PFD cuts have the largest adverse impact on on middle and lower income Alaska families of, of any of the revenue measures, they have the lowest, tr they have a trivial impact uh, on the top 20%. So basically what Mars is arguing uh, in this piece and, and others argue when they say it, don't tax me, don't make me pay for deficits, make middle and lower income Alaska families uh, pay for deficits uh, through PFD cuts. That's exactly backwards of the vision that, that Governor Hammond has. Governor Hammond, Governor Hammond's view was of, of permanent fund earnings, 50% for Alaska residents in the form of PFD, 50% uh, for government. And if government needed more than its 50%, if government needed more uh, than its uh, share, then use taxes uh, uh, to raise the additional amount to pay for government. And Governor Hammond's vision for that, for the reason he supported, the reason he urged that, was because taxes would then fall also on the top 20% and they would push back uh, on government spending. If you don't have taxes, if you don't use taxes uh, to fill uh, any deficits, you don't, the, the only pushback on spending comes from middle and lower income Alaska families who are being uh, impacted by, uh, by PFD cuts. And frankly, as we've seen the last five years, that's not enough right. uh, to cause spending cuts. What, what's happened is the top 20% has continued to say, oh, we need to have we need to have spending. It's important to have the university. It's important to have all these all these things that government has created for Alaskans. And then, you know, in the back room, they tell themselves, and we don't have to pay for it by using PFD cuts. We don't have to pay for it. The one thing we want to do, they tell themselves in the back room, is is to avoid taxes because then we would have to pay for government, and then we would, you know, then we would push back on spending. So as long as we don't have to. Uh, we're off. And, and, and so you see these articles, you see these op-eds by, in this case, Mars, but, but you see them from time to time by others saying, uh, when, when you read and it says, don't you know, use PFD cuts, essentially use PFD cuts to fund spending. What they're really saying is don't tax us to pay for spending, push the costs off on middle and lower income Alaska families. And I think that's just, I think that's uh, a subversion of, of the original vision that uh, the governor had Hammond had uh, for how uh, the state's fiscal uh, situation ought to work, uh, and I think it's a subversion for making it uh, workable, right? Uh, because you don't have the top twenty percent pushing back on spending. The uh, first number one of our weekly top three was covering the governor's budget, and a portion of that budget includes federal funds, which moves us on to number three, which is how are the federal funds going to be used? Which you know are they going to be long term? Are they going to be short term? Are we creating sustainability? What does it look like for this year's budget? But more importantly, what does it mean for what does it mean for next year's budget? Uh, and uh, I guess we'll uh, let's move on to number three. Well, federal funds have become a significant source of, uh, of, of during COVID, federal funds have become a significant source of, uh, of revenue into the state. Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget tracks uh, by state how much uh, federal funds have come into, uh, come into the various states uh, as a result of COVID. And their total for Alaska thus far, um, all sources, all uses, uh, the money that went to individuals, the money that's gone to the state, uh, the money that's uh, gone out in loans and grants uh, uh, to businesses, the total that's come into Alaska is $10.5 billion uh, since, the, uh, since the beginning of COVID. 
uh, a huge amount uh, of money. Um, and so, and so that's that's sort of a one-time hit. When we look back at Alaska's history, uh, we, we we've seen various times when Alaska's sort of been bailed out by one-time huge hits of money. There was a huge influx after the 1964 earthquake, uh, a huge in, in, influx of federal funds that helped uh, get the state's infrastructure back up and running after the the, the Exxon Valdez disaster. Uh, in Prince William Sound, there was a huge amount of money that came in both from federal funding and frankly from private funds from Exxon and others uh, to uh, to restore the state. And that was a that was a huge impact on the state. But what you see after each of those huge bursts of money into the state, federal federal or outside money into the state, is the state sort of falls off. It got it gets used to uh, gets used to the federal money, uses the federal money. The federal money stimulates the economy. Uh, and then when the federal money goes away, the economy has struggles uh, because it sort of got used to those federal funds or got used to those one-time funds, uh, and it sort of, and it struggles as uh, as those monies uh, as those monies wear off. Right. We're seeing another huge burst of federal money come in through uh, through COVID funding, uh, and I think you know it, we're not addressing this in the in in the governor's budget, but I think we need to be prepared. To deal with a situation where, at when that money goes away, uh, we're going to have another uh, another situation where the states are going to be struggling. We got used to a we got used to a supported economy, if you will, an artificial economy. And when that artificial funding that when when that artificial support goes away, and we're sort of back to where the economy was. Uh, it's going to be a it's going to be a struggle for uh, for us to deal with it. Well, that's kind of a microcosm of what we've seen in the state, right? I mean, whether it was federal dollars or state dollars, you know, we become dependent on these things, and all of a sudden, it uh, well, it's got to stay because now people are dependent on it. Um, you know, this this federal dollars. This is not free money. I mean, this is money that comes from the national tax base and everything else and from the borrowing. And as we've seen in the last couple of years, I mean, this is not a cycle that can continue. Uh, this 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 whole uh, printing money, quantitative easing, you know, b- b- bonding more stuff, b- borrowing more money, it can't continue indefinitely. And to become dependent on it is the is the height of uh, of of hubris, I think, at this point, to think that it's just going to continue. We've got to become more self-sufficient. Yeah, it's exactly right, Michael. And 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 people, I mean, a lot of this money is coming through the state. Uh, some of us going individually. I mean, we saw the individual checks that went out, but a lot of this money is coming through the state, and 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 rightfully so. Uh, uh, people in the state don't see that as oh, it's federal money coming through the state. It's one-time money, uh, and 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 so we can't count on it. They see an increase in state services or the continuation of state services. Uh, through a difficult period and supported by federal money, they don't see the federal support that's sitting behind it. And when we get to the other side of it, they 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 say, well, we expect the state to continue uh, these sorts of programs, uh, uh, not understanding that it's federal money that has enabled the state uh, and the localities to continue those sorts of programs. And so that that expectation of of continuation sits there. Um, and and frankly, we're just not ready for it. I mean, as we talked about in the first segment, our budget is strained enough as it is. The governor is using about six hundred or three hundred million dollars next year, six hundred million dollars this year, of, uh, of federal funding to uh, uh, to support state spending. Uh, but beyond that, you know, we're looking at a situation where uh, we go back into deficits, in, in growing deficits um, uh, over the next uh, over the next ten years uh, without without federal support. But but the but people in the state are going to say, oh no, we we made it through COVID, okay. I mean, we made it through COVID with all these services, so we need to continue those services and look to the state to provide them. Well, that's the whole creating a program that creates a dependency, and then let you know. You, you remember the the argument that we've used before that we're going to create a program. Well, how are we going to pay for it? Well, it's free money for now, and when the money stops, we can stop the program. And then, of course, the program starts. It creates a dependency, and then when the federal money runs out, and they say, "Well, we need to stop this program now," like you promised, they said, "Well, we can't stop it now. It's got a dependency." I mean, that's that's really what what's going on here. I mean, I think we could safely say that that what the governor's doing with some of these monies especially the federal dollars, is not a wise use of one-time dollars. You can't create a uh, an ongoing program or an ongoing, uh, an ongoing expenditure with one-time monies. You just, you can't do that. You're going to just make it worse in the long run. 
Well, I think he's using it. I think he's using them. Uh, if he were using them for a bridge, that is, this this is you know we 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 we've had a difficult period. This is this is going to bridge us over to to a period, and here's my solution. It bridges over into a period where it's also going to be difficult. Here's my solution for how we're going to bridge over, either in terms of spending cuts or in terms of substitute revenues uh, for PFD cuts. If he were using those, if you were articulating that as a bridge um, and had a plan for what was on the other side of the bridge, I think that would be I think that would be okay. I think that would be a wise use of the money. But he's but he's it's it's a bridge to nowhere. I mean, he's using it as a bridge. But there's nothing on the other side of the bridge that's preparing us, uh, uh, that's getting us prepared for for what we're going to find when we get to the other side of the bridge. And so I, we just need to recognize, in the middle of everything else, we need to recognize that that we're that we have an artificial economy right now. We have an artificial uh, state budget right now being propped up by being propped up propped up significantly by by federal revenues. Those federal revenues, just like happened in '64 after the earthquake just like happened after Exxon Valdez, those revenues are going to, those federal support revenues are going to go away at some point. We're going to be back on our own and we're not preparing for the day when we're, uh, when we're back on our own. Last two minutes here, Brad. So how do we, so how do we fix that? I mean, I mean, what's, what would be the fix if Brad was at the helm, uh, had your hand on the tiller, what would be the fix for this utilizing the federal monies in a smart way as a bridge? Uh, what, 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 what is your solution? Well, the, the solution is honest budgeting that shows that we have deficits in the out years and confronts those deficits now. I mean, as, as we said when we were talking about the first segment, um, as, the, as the working group said, you've got to, you, you can't just do spending cuts on a dime. We've, all the stuff that we can do on a dime, we've already done. You've got to, you've got to have detailed plans for how you're going to change the formula programs or how you're going to uh, achieve efficiencies to reduce spending. Or you've got to have substitute revenues in place and you can't do substitute revenues on a dime. You've got to put programs in place to develop those substitute revenues. We we need to be using it as a bridge and and have and be putting in place programs that that will that will come into effect when we get to the other side of the bridge. As I said, all we're doing now is it's a bridge to nowhere. We're we're, we're using them as a bridge, but we got nothing in place. We're putting nothing in place uh, to to protect ourselves when we get to the other side of it. So what would Brad do? Brad would put in place programs, we would show the deficit, we would have office, the honest budgeting, uh, and we would address it. We would say, if we don't do this through spending cuts, we're going to have to do it through substitute revenues. And here's the proposed substitute revenues. And hopefully those substitute revenues, the, the prospect of substitute revenues would 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 incentivize people to do the spending cuts. But but at least be honest about it. We're going to have to have one or the other, either spending cuts or or substitute revenues. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, has been our guest. Uh, Brad, I appreciate you sticking with us here uh, into the uh, second hour. Thank you for coming on board, as always. Interesting stuff. We appreciate it. Uh, folks can find you on Facebook. Yeah, go to Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets on uh, on Facebook. And Michael, uh, thanks, uh, thanks for having me on. I, I enjoy the conversation. As always, it's a good convo. Thank you for coming on board. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.